River Road. Turn on the Great River Road. On our way to Continue Nauvoo. Continue on Illinois 96. It's got that special sign. National route. Great River Road so far. We don't see a river, but plenty of farms. I think another three, four miles, we'll start seeing glimpses of it. You can see here on the map with the GPS. Yeah. River says Buzzard Island. Yeah. Looks like it might be heading towards the road. There it is. There it is. Yep. Oh, what is, is that? that? Our house, oh my goodness, that is somebody's that. home. <laughs> Jeez, there's oh a pool goodness. out back. I wonder how much they want for it, babe. <laughs> Should we just go ahead and go ahead ask them if they want to sell it to us? Yeah. But they have to take those wires, those electric wires. Yeah, I don't like those wires back here. there. What a house. Man. My goodness. It's like 25,000 square feet. Look at this. Tell me if you want to pull over to front there, babe. I think we're... We shoot our buggy here. windshield, right? Yeah. Let's see what we're around. Really buggy. Jeez. Darn Red Taurus. Redneck. <laughs> well, Did he's from up? here. He... <laughs> They need to cut these up. bushes down so we can yeah, see Yeah, we can't see the river. It's right there. Well, I, mean, but... I can't believe they wouldn't keep this trimmed down so we can see the river. <laughs> There's an opening. The river. There's an this. opening. Yeah, looks kind of... Mississippi. Yeah, but... Man, there are just all kinds of logs floating in there. Illinois, and... Great River Road. We should have stopped and gotten up. Snapshot of it. There's another one. Scenic turnout. Great point. I don't think they let you over night there, though. Yeah, this is, I don't know if it's shallow here or what, but it's like there's just all kinds of natural trash, but. A lot of logs. Yeah. And trash floating everywhere. Yeah.
around out there. Hmm. Well, we get all those ducks. It explains things. Thirty pilasters. Angel statue at the top. Bell on the clock tower. Mm -hmm. Where is this? I wonder. It must be Salt Lake City. When you think. Did you want to take so sorry? Oh, the shelter is. I don't know what it was. Did you to look at these things? I don't know what it was. 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 This is the visitor center for the Mormons. I guess this is a big global map of the whole community here at Nouveau. People are going to be so excited when they go inside the temple. Okay. Working everywhere. Still don't think it doesn't want to work right. Well, I said the other is a sidewalk. We might be the only ones on the wagon. No, I see people waiting. Are they? Okay. <laughs> Jake and Jesse, those are good names. Hey, Jesse. My goodness. You should have a chance to give them. Yeah. The first part of it. Okay, okay. see this red flashing? Yes. And then, there you go. Okay, that's Jake and Jesse. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The tiniest one I've seen. <laughs> Oops. This is the back. That's fine. No, this is fine. Oh. And those are wonderful, wonderful memories to me. We're grateful that we can let you know about the area. As you come around the this end of the Mississippi River, this area was once owned by the Fox and Sauk Native American Nation. They um, occupied this land for many years. In 1824, it was uh, led by Quick, Chief Quashtwama. And in um, 1824, a retired U.S. Army, Navy, or Army captain came and he traded with the Native Americans. And they, uh, he renamed the area Venus. And he occupied the land until 1836 when he died. He renamed the land Commerce. In the spring of 1839, when the prophet Joseph Smith came here, searching for a place for the saints to settle. And the That's Brigham Young's the house. Homes here. On the one-acre lot, you could yeah. have a home, 
a well, and the CS Bush cellar is built above the ground because of the high water table. And you can have a barn, and an orchard, and a garden, and then a pasture for your livestock. Brother Brigham was, he was called Brother Brigham, obviously. And he was a Western colonizer. He's got a statue in the U.S. Capitol. Because he led 70,000 Latter-day Saints across the plains uh, to the Great Salt Lake. And then they settled there, and then they uh, settled 350 settlements around in the, the Western United States. I would hear them continue on. But it's only three feet wide by 11 feet long, and you can imagine trying to get all your yeah. worldly possessions and food to get your food across the plains. It's Everybody sure walked fairly and easy. little children. The Wainwright shop was where they made the wheels. And there's our blacksmith, <laughs> and he could go in there and help make a little horseshoe for you. And he could catch it, but that's where they made the horseshoes. And then the oxen were in that stock because they can't stand on just three legs. Materials. The men would sacrifice one day in ten to work on the temple, and the women would donate one penny a week for glass and nails. And it doesn't seem like much, does it? But the teachers will share information here about the Mississippi River. It's a wonderful, wonderful river, and uh, the Saints, it was a little bit of an obstacle for them because they had, they lived, some some of them lived in Montrose across the river, and they have to come back and forth, but still a, a wonderful river for the commerce of the U.S. and for the, the uh, wildlife that inhabits it. Thank you. I brought Emma and the children in 1831. The flight part and then the, the summer kitchen, those were added later, but as we come around the corner, um, you can see the original log cabin part of it on the east side of the east end of it here. And then this is the lower landing. The Nauvoo house, this is the red brick here, it was originally uh, built to be a, a hotel, but it was never completed in Joseph's time. But the steamboats would come here to the lower landing and the uh, people would disembark, and then you can imagine what this would have been like, because they, when the Mississippi River was originally made, or, or the way it was at the time of the Saints, they, um, it was much narrower and shallower, and so there was rapids around the bend, so the steam ships, if they were full of uh, cargo, then they had a uh, high center, and so they'd disembark and unload all that, and they'd go up to the north landing, so you can imagine the wagons, everything, loaded and going up and down the mansion house. And Joseph and Emma and the children lived in the front portion uh, from 1843 to 1844. And then uh, the back part was a hotel. And then they had a wing at the back that was also a hotel, but there were 20 rooms. And they also had a stable where they had uh, uh, 30 horses. You win the prize. Unless you make me that. Barbara fixed them. If you travel on two and a half miles up uh, Harley Street, you'll come to the old Nabu burial grounds. And many of the people who lived here in Nabu at that time and passed away are buried there. 1939 was baptized by his brother James. He wanted to meet the prophet so badly that he walked 500 miles to come to Nabu. And he loved the prophet, and he loved Nauvoo, so he returned and got his wife and children and came back to Nauvoo in 1840 to live here. The large hot house on, the, on your right is the home of Joseph Coolidge and his wife, and they were personal friends of the prophet and Emma. He was a cabinet maker and a contractor. Um, 
after he left, there was a, a German immigrant who lived here, and he wrote those German words up there. Do, do any of you speak German? Mm -hmm. We got it translated, and it says, I have been here. Whoever reads this has also been here. The house is mine, and yet not mine. So it is for whoever comes after me. And so that denotes stewardship. We take care of these oh, wonderful things, man. wonderful homes and places. So that's for all those who come after us. And we built a house together. And they had a large family. So they moved in there, and there were 20 people living in the house. 28 so people. Four time, and dinner time, and family home evening. But it's been an experience and a half when So they had school, and all ages would be in one room. We didn't have computers for papers and pencils. We had a. And he was also the editor of the two newspapers. He was with the prophet when he was martyred in Carthage. And John Taylor was shot four times, but he survived the attack, and then he later became the third president of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day is the next one, and this is a wonderful place to visit. We could learn about Jonathan Browning, who was the famous inventor of the repeating rifle. And you can also see a demonstration on her of how a barrel rifle was made. On your left is the silver kind of thing. You've got your utensils, your plates, your cups, your pots and pans, buckets. Taking us to the same place, yeah. They just called it something. Hotel Nouveau. We are going to the Red Front. And this we got an order up there. This is going to set up as a little bit of a little visitor center. Um, so just one sec. Our so we're on a tour of Homes of the Apostles. It's a 90 minute tour. And as you probably can see from the last clip, no video pictures allowed inside the homes. We're walking, I think she says about a half mile walk, to the next home of three that we're looking at. I think it's only three. So, um, quite interesting, I guess, if you're into this kind of stuff. Uh, Nice place here, right on the Mississippi. Nouveau. Mormon establishment. The Normans were run off from here, I guess, to Salt Lake City. Uh, it's kind of bad that they were forced to leave just about everywhere they went until they got to New York City. They do have a real big temple that you probably saw. It appears though they've reclaimed this whole community. A little wind coming through. And now it's a very nice tourist spot. It seems that a lot of the Mormons, seems like every one of the license tags around here is from Utah. But it seems like it's a big mecca uh, for Mormons to come and relive their history. Not quite, I guess, as important to me and Kathy, but. Uh, Seems like most of the people here are Mormons. The people working here as well as the tourists. Okay, this is our last tour of the day. It starts at 4 o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. Bakery, and then we go into Browning Guns. Gunsmith or Guns, yeah. They're probably not going to let me film. I wish they would let me film in the Browning Guns place, but 
Probably not. shop and the starter gin shop um, was uh, this is the uh, on the original foundation as well as well as that building too most of the buildings almost all of the buildings here were built on the original foundation um, pretty much every single one so most of the time when you look at a limestone foundation that's something like that that means that it's the original foundation and uh, but this building it had quite a few things it even had a tree growing through it um, that was how um, old and it, but there was, it was a little bit old though. Um, and so over time it grew a lot. But this is something about tin though. And part of what a tin is, is just basically a lightweight metal. And that's kind of just a type of metal that would have been just used for stuff like buckets and cans and things like that. So it would have been very easy and um, kind of like the modern, uh, kind of like the olden day plastic before plastic was invented. Um, fresh. 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 Alright, so this is how they would have made a tin tin, um, 1840s style. So a something um, first is that the tinsmith would have done is they would come over to their wall of patterns. And now obviously um, this would have these patterns would just make a good um, stencil. So if you've ever like if you ever use those stencils part when you were a kid, you know, that had the shape of like a star or a heart or something, and then you would just color it. So I, this is the Jonathan Browning Gunsmith Building. And so the building on the right, right here, it is a two-story building. And part of what makes this um, the two-story building is that this part of the building was Benjamin Bird. A man named Benjamin Bird, and so he gave his uh, so Benjamin Bird gave his uh, um, property to Jonathan Browning, and eventually, by doing that, he um, Jonathan Browning, when he bought the property, added on this middle section, and then eventually, and then even added on that blacksmith portion, which is that left little building on the side and now uh, for a gunsmith that little blacksmith portion would have been very 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 helpful and um, to have that blacksmith's um, portion so guys so that way it's pretty easy for him to just go to work um, but not just that that was pretty farther uh, far enough away from the home itself that it won't heat up the entire home um, during the summer so that would have been a very ideal place and this would have been a very ideal building. And now they also, they had 10 children. So this would have been, again, also very helpful to have this bigger home and this nicer home. And it is definitely one of the mo uh, more bigger homes of the ones that we have here in Nauvoo. Now, Sister Bowman will guide you in and tell you a little bit more about Jonathan. Oh, have my... I will get you it. Something first is that Jonathan. 
Elizabeth Browning and his wife Elizabeth Browning. So this is a picture of both of them. So this picture to the left is Jonathan Browning and then the picture to the right is Elizabeth Browning. And both when they are in their older years. But when they um, they came here to Illinois um, first before the Mormons were here. And uh, my, it's kind of funny how he joined the church here in Illinois because uh, that typically most of Mormons came here. And I just want to tell you that it is very interesting and I know that all of you guys will want to look at it. And don't worry, we will be coming back. So just don't want to worry you. you. But we will be coming back to that room. Um, so we will pass it. No. Mm. Yeah. Like <laughs> fish can get up.
So, we have a question. Has anyone in here played American football or just played around with their family with the football? Yeah? A few of you? Awesome. So, do any of you know what is a trick you can do throwing that football to make it go more accurately? Exactly. If you can get that football to spin in the air, it's going to go a lot farther and be more accurate. So that is the same actually with a bullet. If you can get that spinning as it comes out of your barrel, it's going to do a lot better and shoot where you want it to. So how are we going to do this to the gun? What they had to do is try to make a spiral pathway on the inside of the barrel. And to do this, we have another steel rod. And on the end of the steel rod, we have a little bar, or almost like a knife on the end. Because steel is more hard than our soft iron doesn't even have to be hot. But we're going to basically push this little knife inside the barrel and it's going to scratch or carve a path inside and we're connected to this wooden cylinder that is set up so that it's going to spin the end of that um that end of that metal to make a spiral inside so this is just a little piece of our gun barrel but they would have gone back and forth to scratch that path and they would have done this 200 times in one pathway, but to, to make um, a good barrel, um, you are going to want seven. So you'd have to do seven pathways 200 times back and forth with that big, long barrel. So you can imagine Jonathan Browning probably had some pretty big guns, <laughs> but once we have that, we have just the barrel finished. And you still have to do other things to mechanical things to make your gun shoot and everything. But one gun would have taken about 14 days to make just one gun. And these were 10 hour work days. So it was a lot of work to be a gunsmith. But, once he made this gun, he could sell it for about $24. And that doesn't sound like a lot today, but back then, people on average made $1 every day. So if he could make $24 in 14 days, that was pretty good money and a pretty good living for Jonathan and his family. But he didn't just hog this talent to himself and um, take all the riches for himself. But he even taught people in the Navajo community how to be a gunsmith themselves. And he, of course, also taught his sons this trade. So the Browning um, name is still known today for making their guns and their company. And Sister Shepherd is gonna take us back into this gun room where she'll show us some of the original guns that
some bullets be into a gun. And so because of having multiple bullets into a smaller gun um, is because of him. And that, so that is something that definitely the armed forces um, now, today, it's got to be hard to remember everything. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Look at that. An oldie, huh? <laughs> What is it we're looking at? The tunnel. Oh, way over there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at the garden, huh? I thought it was the outhouse. So when we were renovating these homes around here, they were digging in this back garden area, and they found a little oak box with some colored fabric in it, and they discovered this little tiny coffin that was buried in this backyard. And we have a great headstone memorial that we put. We buried it back in the ground and put this little memorial over that coffin. And we later found out that this was very likely that it's the coffin of a little girl named Emma Eliza, who was the tenth and last child of the Browning family that lived here. And Emma Eliza only lived to be seven weeks old before she ended up passing. 